Um, we, act, we have a phenomenal schedule of speakers, of events, of uh, sessions lined up today, and I really do hope that these sessions provide this important bridge and link between East and West. The networking is obviously a huge part of this, and we hope that you get the chance to meet everyone over the course of this event. Now, we TIFF, here at TIFF have been a longtime champion of Asian cinema through our festival programming as well as through our year-round programming. And this year's festival lineup offers films from virtually every single country across the region, providing further proof that the Asian film industry is one of the most important and dynamic in the world today. And looking at the uh, summit agenda, absolutely thrilled with the lineup of people that have come, are speaking, are involved in some of the panels. When Cameron raised the idea of an Asian film summit that would bring together some of the brightest industry minds from East and West, we knew that we were tapping into a wealth of expertise. And both Cameron and Noah have really concentrated on this region, personally and professionally, nurturing and developing relationships within the Asian film industry. Since last year's inaugural Asian Film Summit, TIFF Bell Lightbox has hosted a huge, huge amount of Asian cinema. This summer saw the massive century of Chinese cinema. We had 70 films that Noah programmed from that area, while major retrospectives of Japanese and Indian cinema were included in our spring and winter programs. Now, these programs, in addition to other initiatives now in the works, signal our commitment to encouraging cross-cultural partnerships, and increasing the flow of conversations between both East and West. I'm hopeful that today's event will obviously foster and deepen these relationships and generate new business opportunities between key players in the East and West. So before I turn things over to camera, I just want to thank uh, our sponsors, our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, Visa, and Audi, and our major public supporters, Telefilm Canada, the Ontario Media Development Corporation. Our presenting partner, the Government of Ontario through the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport. And we'd also like to acknowledge and thank Pinewood Studios Group, who are a sponsor of the Asian Film Summit. And finally, we offer our appreciation to the lovely Shangri-La Hotel. This is a fantastic uh, venue for us to be hosting the summit. So on behalf of TIFF, we wish you a phenomenal day of conversation, of listening to people, hearing ideas. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce my, one of my co-partners in crime, very close colleague, Cameron Bailey, Artistic Director of the Festival. Cameron. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, it promises to be a kind of a hot, sweltering day, and uh, we hope that the ideas are as steamy and as, uh, as productive for you, as fertile, let's say. Um, this is the second year for the Asian Film Summit. Um, one of the panels this afternoon is called Local Stories, Global Films. Really, that's the theme of everything we're trying to do with the summit. We understand that when we're talking about the connection, the bridge between Asia and the West, um, it really it's not a matter of talking about giant hemispheres. It's a matter of talking about individual local stories in, in places that are distinct, different from one another within each region and how those things can travel internationally. Um, I was fortunate en enough to be in Tokyo this summer when the weather was a little bit like this but even hotter um, to see a, the new film by Hayao Miyazaki called The Wind Rises. Um, he is someone that I think all of us at TIFF have enormous respect for. We've had very successful retrospectives of, of his work. It was an exciting thing. It was a thrill just to go to Studio Ghibli to see his new film. I saw the film. I sat in the screening room with our programmer, Giovanna Fulvi, um, at, as the guests of uh, Jeffrey Wexler from Studio Ghibli, who's here right uh, now this morning. And as I was watching the film, I realized that this was a very local film. It was a personal story. It was very specific to J Japan, to Mi Miyazaki-san's own um, perspective on the creative process and the beauty of that process. And it was a film that came from a very local place. And yet, this is a film by one of the, the major global filmmakers represented in international sales by a Paris-based company, Wild Bunch, distributed in, in North America by one of the biggest American uh, companies, Disney. This really was the embodiment of a local story, a personal film that could somehow travel the entire world. When you see it here at the festival, it's premiering tonight. 
Um, and if, when it goes into release later on, I think you'll understand what I mean. This is exactly what we're trying to achieve uh, when it comes to the Asian Film Summit, to find more ways of uh, opening space in the world for more people like Hayao Miyazaki so that they can tell their own personal, local stories and have them reach the entire world. Today's uh, series of, uh, of talks will be very much based uh, uh, from that theme. They'll be very practical. We've got a great networking lunch later on, which will give people the opportunity to connect directly and talk about their new projects. We're doing an animation panel for the first time uh, with people like Michael Fukushima and Shilpa Renate. We've got our first African participant in the Asian Film Summit, which is also uh, a, a big step forward with Stephen Markovitz from South Africa, doing things like a, the case study of Man of Tai Chi, uh, a co-production between uh, the U.S. Uh, and China uh, with Keanu Reeves and his producer, Lamore Sivan. And we are very fortunate to have the amazing Johnny Toe come back for an in-conversation with, uh, with one of our, our dear colleagues, um, Marco Muller. And um, I'm also very happy to have people like Tom Yoda and Harvey Weinstein be a part of today. So we have tried our best to find some of the leaders in the industry on both sides of the Pacific uh, be a part of the, uh, the summit today. And uh, we also hope that on a, on a more granular level, you're able to meet people who will be useful to you in your professional work uh, in the days and years to come. Um, now I would like to... Okay, so China's not cheap anymore necessarily. No. But what about the whole, obviously a lot of people go there because if you set up a co-production you can get through the, the quota system. I mean, you're not so much on the financing side, but have you worked with people who are going that route and does it look like it's getting any easier because it's been quite complicated in the past? Yeah, nothing's easy in China and it won't be for uh, many years to come, but the benefits I think are all there. Um, I'm not an expert on co-production, but obviously co-production gets you around the quota system, which gets you into the Chinese box office, which gets you into the second largest box office in the world. So I think the benefits are pretty obvious. And I think a lot of us want to be there for those uh, upside prospects. Right. So if we can just, we don't have a huge amount of time this morning. So if you could boil things down to what do you think are the key elements that you need when you're going into China? What's the most important thing to keep in mind? 100% uh, guanxi, which is uh, a Chinese word for relationships. And if you conduct business in China, you'll hear that a lot. Uh, everything is relationship-based. You cannot expect to go to China alone and be successful. You need to make those critical contacts and those critical relationships. Um, I can't stress that enough. I've been on the ground for 18 years, so I'm uh, boots on the ground, and there are a lot of other people like me who are operating with a lot of experience. And, uh, and this goes not just for China, but across the region. I, work in, I worked in seven different countries in Southeast Asia last year, and I couldn't have done it without uh, working with the right people in each country. And I spent a lot of, uh, I front-loaded a lot of my time to vet uh, and do my due diligence on the partners that I needed to accomplish what I needed to do. And that made all the difference. And I have to say, I was very, very happy with myself. I, I pretty much had 100% batting average when I did that big project for Coca-Cola last year. Um, everyone I worked with was great, but I spent literally weeks of anxiety and second guessing and lots of phone calls and lots of vetting, but it worked out. Right, but how do you build up those relationships? Is it just a case of being there for a really long time and having a lot of dinners and uh, <laughs> just putting the time in? I think, um, I think you can rely on, on people like me who have been, a um, little advertising there, um, people like me who have been on the ground for a long time, uh, but I think you can also develop your own uh, relationships and contacts, but that means a lot of time investment for you and a lot of trips and a lot of jet lag. But uh, if you believe in the future of China and Southeast Asia cinema, and I think you have to because it's there and it's growing and it's a population of two billion people with a mass massive economy, um, I think that it's going to be well worth your time. But if you're a producer who's going in cold, say you've never been to China before and you're setting up a project there, Obviously, you need to speak to local production services people, but who else would you advise people to get to know? Maybe on the government side or... It really, it really depends on the type of project you're doing. Um, one of the biggest benefits of being in China for as long as I have been has been my political contacts. Um, 
China is a, nothing really happens without the government's involvement. And that's not a bad thing, by the way. Uh, we used to be terrified of the Chinese government when I first started years ago with Bertinsky. Um, and we realized we were getting nowhere. And when we finally engaged the Chinese government in a very sincere way, um, they opened the gates of China to us. And so I think, uh, depending on what you're doing, in terms of documentary, it's very important to have political uh, consensus. Um, if you're doing a more commercial job, uh, money helps, but politics don't necessarily factor. Um, but certainly, you need to start branching out and making those contacts uh, for whatever makes sense to you and your project. And there are uh, lots of local producers, uh, both foreign and Chinese, on the ground in China who know what they're doing. Uh, you just need to meet them and build consensus and create those relationships. And that means getting on planes and having dinner and, yes, drinking a lot of alcohol. But basically, uh, the people you need to know for movies is slightly different from the people you need for documentaries or for commercials. They all have their own sort of ecosystem, would you say? Yeah, absolutely. There, there is, there is a, a division. Um, a lot of the people I work with work uh, only in commercials, and then I work with other people that are only feature-based uh, and documentary. So you, you do need to find the right people who make sense for your project. And the government officials, they're quite open to talking to foreigners who are coming in to shoot. I mean, do you find that it's quite easy to get them to sit down and talk to you? Or for somebody who's just starting out, would that be a, take a long time to handle? Yeah, no, it's very difficult. Um, I've been there a long time, and because I've been there early, I develop relationships with government officials who were very low on the totem pole back then, and now they have uh, a lot more power. Uh, they've uh, excelled in the ranks of the Chinese government, and um, I go to them very sparingly. Uh, they're very special contacts, and um, you need to know how to communicate with them as well. But uh, when you get into a grind, uh, they can be very useful. Okay. So your partners should have good political contacts, and that's very, very, very important. Right, thanks. That's very useful to know. So what do you think, you've seen a lot of people come in over the years with different types of projects. What are some of the sort of classic mistakes that people make when they come to China to shoot? I, I think the misconceptions about China are still quite real. It's, um, it's not really a communist country. It's probably the most unbridled uh, uh, capitalist nation on the planet, which is exciting. Um, but I think a lot of people come in with uh, ignorance. And um, what I've seen over the years, which does not work for anyone is uh, a sense of superiority uh, and that comes from maybe not so much Canadians but uh, I see a lot of Hollywood producers come in and they they feel a little bit superior uh, they look around and they you know um, they're a bit arrogant and the Chinese can smell that a thousand miles away and it works very much against you so I think you need to come in not as a pushover but you need to come in you know with a little bit of modesty and um, and some sincerity and, and just and take it slow and you'll figure it out uh, as time comes. But arrogance is the, uh, is the wrong approach. And what about, do you think people have some of the wrong expectations when they come into the country in terms of how long things are going to take to happen? I mean, what's your experience being with that? It takes longer. Everything <laughs> takes longer in China. Right. Everything takes longer. So uh, if you think you need a two month prep, you need a three month prep. If you, uh, uh, it just takes longer, so factor that into everything you do in China. And, uh, you know, the art is in prep. And if you get your prep right, then you get your production right. So invest in the relationships, invest in a lot of trips before the shoot, and um, spend, spend the time that you need to get it done right. If you rush a project in China, you will find yourself in a very horrible disaster very quickly. And I guess you also have to be extremely flexible, and I was hoping you could tell the story that you told me yesterday about the bridge as a demonstration of how sometimes you really have to think on your feet. Yeah, so um, I shot a BMW commercial last year in Beijing and we location scouted a brand new bridge that was opened up on the Fifth Ring Road and it was fantastic. Um, and we got client approval, um, but nothing gets locked down in China. Um, you, don't, you can't go to a uh, film body and get a permit to lock something down. You have to be very clever about how you approach these things. So we had contacts with the local police and we approached them. Uh, and once again, those are not my contacts. There was somebody I was working with who knew somebody who knew somebody who has a brother who works in the police station. And that's very much China, by the way. That is China right there. And, um, 
Anyway, long story short, we got permission to shoot the bridge for two hours, which was, which was a huge coup. Um, we started our first day somewhere else and we shot that out and by the end of our day, uh, everything was looking great until we got the phone call from the police saying they would not be able to help us the next day for the bridge shoot, which was uh, a huge devastation I've never experienced before. I kept calm. Um, I didn't tell my client and uh, <laughs> I told my crew to keep trying um, and let's, let's see what happens. So we pushed through the night and the next morning and in the end, we still couldn't turn the police around and uh, we lost the location. Now, that wasn't my fault, it wasn't anyone's fault, it's not even the police fault. They had some other political agenda or you know, police related event, so it just didn't happen. Um, what happened though, was that the next day was one of the most horrific polluted days I've ever seen in Beijing. It was 590 on the index. The index goes to 500, by the way, and it doesn't go anymore. So 590 is really bad. You could not see the bridge. The bridge was invisible. And so my client, I let my client come up to me and, and my client said, listen, Noah, I think we can't shoot the bridge today. And I said to him, I completely agree. <laughs> so, um, so, but, but let, me, let me vindicate the police for a second. Uh, we uh, re revamped and uh, we decided to reshoot after Chinese New Year, which was about 10 days later. And we kept working with the police and they came through. And we woke up one morning, the police showed up, it was a blue sky, you could see the bridge, and we shot the most wonderful, wonderful footage of a BMW. 